Hello wonderful people, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my cardiology playlist. In previous videos we talked about digoxin, we talked about cardiovascular physiology, we talked about statins, we talked about the difference between physiological murmurs and pathological murmurs, we talked about the cardiovascular changes during pregnancy and much more. Today we're talking about constrictive pericarditis. Why itis? Because it's inflammation. Inflammation of what? Of the sac? that surrounds the heart, pericarditis. We have many types of pericarditis, including dry pericarditis and pericarditis with effusion, known as pericardial effusions. These effusions could be transudative, exudative, hemorrhagic, or chylus. There is also adhesive pericarditis and today's topic, constrictive pericarditis, where my poor heart is constricted within a very thick, pericardial membrane. So click the like button, click the subscribe button and let's get started. Please watch my cardiology videos in order for maximum understanding and retention, not to be confused with my urinary retention. Here's your lovely heart. We have three layers. On the inside, there's the endocardium. Endo means inside and cardium means heart. Then we have the myocardium, which is the muscle layer made of cardiac muscles. Then we have the pericardium, which is the outermost layer of the heart. Peri means around, as in periosteum, around the bone, perichondrium, around cartilage, and pericardium, around the heart. Pericarditis types, there are many classifications. You can classify pericarditis any way you want. You can classify it into dry versus wet. By wet, I mean with effusion. You can also classify it as acute pericarditis and chronic pericarditis. Acute pericarditis, we have the idiopathic nonspecific one, and we have the infectious pericarditis. A very important infection is tuberculosis. That's a bacterial infection. Viral infections can lead to pericarditis as well. Does pericarditis elevate my troponin? Usually not unless it is myopericarditis, i.e. if the cardiac involvement is in the pericardium plus the myocardium. Because remember the troponin comes from what? from within the cardiac muscle, and the muscle is in the myocardium. If you thought that troponins are only elevated in cases of myocardial infarctions, then you are as naive as the B lymphocyte before it recognized the antigen. Many students don't get that joke because they don't read. God help us, that's the acute pericarditis. We can also have chronic pericarditis, such as chronic adhesive pericarditis and chronic constrictive pericarditis, which is today's topic. You see this nasty tuberculosis right here? It is the same tuberculosis that can also lead to constrictive pericarditis. How about radiation exposure? Yes, post-radiation exposure, I can develop constrictive pericarditis. How about after cardiac surgery? Yes, indeed, after cardiothoracic surgery, I can develop constrictive pericarditis. Next, let's put some fluid in the pericardial sac. Pericardial effusion could be exudate, transudate, blood, or lymph, i.e. chylo. If it's exudative, it's called seropericardium. What does the word serosanguinous mean? Sero means a pussy, and sanguinous means bloody. Blood and pus is serosanguinous. Just sero means exudate. Your beloved neutrophils with their secretions. Infections can lead to exudative pericardial effusion, and don't forget cancers, especially cancer metastasis. A very common exam question is, they give you a patient with history of breast cancer. The breast cancer metastasized to the heart, leading to exudative malignant pericardial effusion. That's what we're talking about here. Next, transudative, uh, also known as hydropericardium, because this fluid is clear. Protein poor, cell poor compared to the exudative. Uh, what are the causes of transudate? Just as regular pathology. Any transudate in the body, just say cirrhotic, nephrotic, and CHF. If you are super sophisticated, you can also add quashier core syndrome, minitriase disease, malabsorption syndrome, third degree burns, and much more. Next, blood. I can see this in cases of trauma, aortic dissection, ruptured aortic aneurysm, and much more. How about if the injury affected not the aorta, but the thoracic duct, chylopericardium. How can we differentiate between a transudate and an exudate? Please refer to my pulmonology playlist. I have a video titled exudate versus transudate pleural effusion. The same criteria can apply for pericardial effusions. More protein, more cells, less proteins, less cells. What do cells have? LDH. Oh, so more LDH. 
less LDH. Why more protein, more cell, and more LDH? Because we have more neutrophils, and neutrophils have secretions made of proteins. They are one of the granulocytes, for heaven's sake. But trans, they do not have neutrophils, which means they do not have many cells, they do not have much protein, they do not have much LDH. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. If you want to download these colorful notes, go to medicosisperfectionatus.com. If you really want to understand constrictive pericarditis, then bring a pen and paper and draw with me. Let's go. Here is the right side of your heart, and here is the left side of your heart. This is right atrium and right ventricle, and there you have a left atrium and left ventricle. Here is my lovely interatrial and interventricular septum. Connected to the right atrium, of course, is the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Connected to the left atrium are the four pulmonary veins. Nice and clean, let's get into it. What is constrictive pericarditis? The heart is constricted by a very thick, and you need to emphasize thick, calcified pericardium around it. Okay, now what? Well, this heart is trying to relax during diastole, right? Yeah, the ventricles are relaxing during diastole. The question is, can they relax when they are surrounded by this thick, rocky, calcified pericardium? The answer is no. The heart cannot relax during diastole, which decreases cardiac filling. There is decreased filling on the right side, and there is decreased filling on the left side. If you have studied right-sided versus left-sided heart failure before, you will relate to what I'm going to say. Okay, this constrictive pericarditis has decreased cardiac filling. There is decreased preload on the right side. Therefore, what? Well, this right ventricle cannot relax and accept that blood during diastole. So all of that blood will pile up in the right atrium, which will pile up in the superior and inferior vena cava. Superior vena cava piling up will lead to jugular venous distension, distended neck veins, increased jugular venous pressure. And downstairs in the inferior vena cava, who's there? Oh, that's my inferior vena cava. Who's connected to your inferior vena cava? Liver, which means I get hepatic congestion or congestion of the hepatic capsule of Gleason. That's some old school medicine right there. But wait, it gets worse. Piling up, backing up of blood into my portal vein. Portal venous hypertension. If this is severe enough, I can get ascites. And the ascites starts before the lower extremity edema, a condition known as ascites precox, ascites before the lower extremity edema. Who else drains to your inferior vena cava? How about my gut? Oh, your stomach, intestine, etc. Yeah, remember, you go portal vein, and then you go inferior vena cava. So my intestines will get upset. I can get secondary intestinal lymph angiectasia. Ectasia means dilation, lymph means lymph, angi means vessel, dilation of lymphatic vessels in my gut. Why? Because of all of this pressure. All of us wanted to drain to the heart, but none of us can. Moreover, remember that even the lymph that drains to the thoracic duct has to come back to veins, because the thoracic duct drains its lymph into the venous circulation, but the heart cannot accept anything, both blood and lymph. And if that is severe enough, I can even develop cirrhosis. Are you serious? Yeah, one of the causes of liver cirrhosis is constrictive pericarditis. Never underestimate the pressure. It's called physics, baby. Now forget constrictive pericarditis and let's talk about normal, okay? Normally, if you were lying down and suddenly decided to stand up, okay? You stood up all at once. What's gonna happen? If you're normal, your sympathetic nervous system will constrict the veins in your lower extremities to push the blood up to increase venous return to the heart. But in case of constrictive pericarditis, do you think the venous return will actually reach the right ventricle? No. Less coming in means less going out. If there is less input, there is less output. And symptoms of low cardiac output include orthostasis, postural hypotension, dizziness, syncope. All of this can happen. And there is something else called positive Kuzmol sign. Now, what is this? Before I tell you what Kuzmol sign is, let me tell you about the normal. Normally, if you breathe in, what's gonna happen? If I breathe in, <gasps> look at the size of your chest cavity. Your chest cavity enlarges. As the chest cavity enlarges, what's gonna happen to the volume of the chest cavity? It increases according to Boyle's law. When volume goes up, what's gonna happen to the pressure in your chest cavity? 
it will decrease. I'm gonna lower the pressure in my chest cavity provided that the temperature remains constant, which it is because you are not a cold-blooded animal. So pressure in my chest cavity will decrease. What does negative pressure do? It sucks in stuff. So your chest will pull in blood from upstairs, from your brain and head and neck, and from downstairs, from your ankle. All of them are going towards the chest. So blood is going suddenly towards the chest. Okay, if you're normal, then your right ventricle should be able to relax during diastole beautifully and accept all of that extra blood. The question is, if I have constrictive pericarditis, do you think my right ventricle can relax and accept that blood? Heck no. Where do you think all of that blood will pile up? It will pile up in the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. During physical exam, it is difficult to assess the inferior vena cava, but the superior vena cava is connected to what? To the internal jugular vein, and you can examine the neck veins. They'll be super congested during inspiration. So, under normal circumstances, during inspiration, your jugular veins should empty their blood into the heart. But in constrictive pericarditis, during inspiration, they failed to empty into the heart, so your jugular veins will be distended during inspiration, and this is called what? Cosmal sign. All of these are the manifestations of constrictive pericarditis on the right side. Now, let's talk about the manifestations of decreased cardiac filling on the left side. Decreased preload to the left side of the heart will lead to what? Backing up of blood into the left atrium, because the left ventricle cannot relax and accept the blood. All of the blood is going where? To my pulmonary veins, and then backing up to the lungs, leading to pleural effusion and pulmonary edema. And since there is less input into the left ventricle because it could not accept the blood, there will be less output from the heart and the patient can develop symptoms of low cardiac output. Another sign that can take place in constrictive pericarditis is pulsus paradoxus, which is neither pulsus nor paradoxus. It is not a pulsus, it's a change in blood pressure, not pulse. And it's not paradox, it's not a paradox, it's not opposite of normal, it's an exaggeration of normal. First, before I tell you about pulses paradoxes, let me tell you about the normal. Normally, during inspiration, what happens? Well, the chest volume increases, so the pressure in my chest cavity decreases. I have low intrathoracic pressure, which means the blood will be summoned from upstairs and from downstairs towards the heart. This sudden gush of blood into the right side of the heart, i.e. right ventricle, will cause increased volume in the right ventricle and increased pressure in the right ventricle. So the right ventricle will push onto his friend the left ventricle. This interventricular septum will be shifted slightly to the left, which decreases the volume of the left ventricle, which means the left ventricle cannot accept as much blood. Less input to the left ventricle equals less output from the left ventricle. And we'll notice that during inspiration, there is a drop in my systolic blood pressure by about, let's say, 5 millimeters, 6 millimeters, anything below 10 millimeters, okay? This is normal, but if I have pulses paradoxus, let's say I have constrictive pericarditis, what do you think is going to happen? Sudden gush of blood towards the right ventricle. The right ventricle tried to relax, it could not, so it will push even more on his friend, the left ventricle. The left ventricle will be diminished and squished into oblivion. And during inspiration, there will be a drop in my systolic blood pressure by more than 10 millimeters of mercury. This, my friend, is not a paradox. This is an exaggeration of the normal phenomenon. And this is the beauty of doodling with medicosis. If you haven't drawn all of this on pen and paper, there is simply no hope for you. You are more hopeless than a protracted labor. I'm just joking. So what have we learned? Constrictive pericarditis, there is decreased filling on the right side and decreased filling on the left side. Decreased filling on the right will give me jugular venous distension, positive cosmal sign, postural hypotension, hepatic congestion, portal hypertension, cirrhosis, and secondary intestinal lymph and geactasia. Also, I forgot something. Remember my inferior vena cava? Yeah, it was congested. Yeah, now what? Now who drains into the inferior vena cava? Kidneys, oh yeah. I can get protein urea. So protein in the urine could be nephrotic syndrome, of course, it could also be nephritic syndrome, it could be renal failure, and it could be constrictive pericarditis. 
Just think about that. Wrap your head around this. Decreased cardiac filling on the left side will give me pleural effusion, pulmonary congestion, symptoms of low cardiac output, pulses paradoxus, formerly known as pulses paradoxicus. Pulses paradoxus and cosmol sign, you can see them in cases of constrictive pericarditis, which is today's topic. You can also see them in cardiac tamponade, which you will find in another video on this cardiology playlist. Pulses paradoxus is neither a pulses nor a paradox. It's just an exaggeration of the normal phenomenon and it's not pulses, it's actually blood pressureous. Normally, when you inhale, systolic blood pressure should drop by less than 10 millimeters of mercury. Let's say that before you inspired, your systolic was 120. When you inspired during inspiration, let's say it became 116. That's a drop of 4 millimeters of mercury, which is less than 10, which makes you normal. However, if I have constrictive pericarditis, this thick calcified pericardium around the heart, there will be a greater drop in the systolic blood pressure. This is an exaggeration of a normal phenomenon that happens to the blood pressure during inspiration. How about Kuzmol sign? Normally during inspiration, I have increased volume but decreased intrathoracic pressure, which raises venous return, i.e. it sucks blood in towards the right atrium then the right ventricle. So the neck veins should normally empty during inspiration. But if I have a thick pericardium, Inspiration will give me the opposite, filling of neck veins, jugular venous distension. What are possible causes of constrictive pericarditis? On your exam, they love these three causes. Tuberculosis, never ever forget this. Post cardiothoracic surgery. Let's say the patient had triple bypass, double bypass, post cardiotomy. Because remember, in order to reach anything inside the heart, we have to break into the pericardium. You make a hole into the heart, cardiotomy. After radiation exposure, I can get constrictive pericarditis and these are the three main causes that you will be tested on. If you want others, we have disseminated coccidioidemycosis. If tuberculosis can do it, coccidioidemycosis can do it. If constrictive pericarditis happens to me after disseminated coccidioidemycosis, I'll take the room temperature challenge. This is a forensic pathology joke, i.e. it is rapidly fatal. More causes, please. Lupus and rheumatoid, coxsackie and echoviruses, leukemias and lymphomas, hydralazine and procainamide, and don't forget uremia. What type of calcified pericardium are we talking? Is it dystrophic calcification or metastatic calcification? Well, since the calcification is local, caused by something local, it is dystrophic most of the time. Now, can you answer these parameters when it comes to constrictive pericarditis? What's going to happen to the cardiac output? What's going to happen to blood pressure? How about heart rate? Central venous pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and total peripheral resistance, also known as systemic vascular resistance. Please pause and try to answer these yourself. Remember, we said what? Less input equals less output. The ventricles could not relax, and that's why they cannot accept blood. If they cannot accept blood, they cannot shoot blood to the outside world, cardiac output will decrease, and I will suffer from low cardiac output symptoms. If cardiac output goes down, what do you think is going to happen to my blood pressure? It tends to decrease. In fact, constrictive pericarditis is one of the causes of shock, and shock is defined as inadequate tissue perfusion. Please go back to your physiology and review your baroreceptor reflex. When blood pressure goes down, what's going to happen to heart rate? It goes up. And when blood pressure goes down, what's going to happen to my total peripheral resistance? It tends to increase in order to try to raise the blood pressure back to normal. How did the baroreceptor reflex raise the heart rate and the TPR? By sending sympathetic fibers. Beta-1 will help me raise the heart rate and alpha-1 will help me raise the peripheral resistance. Next, if my heart is surrounded by a very thick pericardium, do you think it will be able to relax and accept blood? The answer is no. So the blood will pile up here in the right atrium, which means that the central venous pressure, which is the fancy name for the right atrial pressure because your right atrium is quote unquote your central vein. It is the biggest vein in your body. It's not a vein. Oh yeah, but look at this. Superior vena cava and inferior vena cava are connected to it. It's the central vein. It's the vein that's in the center of my body, in the heart. How about pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? Well, depending on who you read, it could depend. 
If you can say, well, the left ventricle could not relax either, so the blood will pile up into the left atrium, so pulmonary capillary which pressure will go up. Yes, indeed. However, keep in mind that it is not as high as in cases of pure cardiogenic shock, as in myocardial infarction, or how about cardiac tamponade? That would be higher pulmonary capillary rich pressure. So with here, they usually like you to answer as normal or slightly elevate. A tip for the pros. When they ask you about central venous pressure, think of right atrial pressure. But when they ask you about pulmonary capillary rich pressure, think of the left atrial pressure. Constrictive pericarditis in one slide. I have a very thick calcified pericardium. It's calcified. It is hard as a rock. What do you think happens to cardiac compliance? Think of compliance as similar to expansibility or distensibility. Do you think the heart can distend and expand? Heck no, there is low cardiac compliance. How about the cardiac filling? Low, especially in the ventricles during lay diastole, because during lay diastole, the ventricles will try to stretch out the most and they will hit the thick pericardium. Low input equals low output. Because this is calcified like a rock, what do I hear? Do I hear the normal lub dub S1, S2? No, you do not hear lub dub. You hear lub knock. Why? Because during diastole, the ventricles relax until they hit this thick calcified pericardium. So you hear a knock. I can get pulses paradoxes, I can get cosmal sign, I can get jugular venous distension, ascites, and lower extremity edema, but the ascites usually starts before the edema in this case. If you try to feel the impulse of the apex, or the apex pulse, or the apical pulse, you will not feel it. Why? Because a hard, thick, calcified pericardium is separating your finger from the patient's apex. That was not the most appropriate way to describe it. Causes are many, don't forget tuberculosis, post-cardiac surgery, and post-radiation exposure. Let's do a chest x-ray or a CT scan. You will find this thick calcified pericardium. Calcium appears white or white-ish under x-ray or CT scan. And this is sometimes referred to as the water bottle sign. Radiologists are so creative. This hot is the water because it has blood, it's fluid. And surrounded by what? It is surrounded by the wall of the bottle. Yeah, it's the water bottle sign. Let's do a cardiac MRI. You'll find a very thick pericardium, thicker than four millimeters. EKG, well, EKG are electrodes uh, on my chest. Oh, but do you think they'll be able to reach the heart if there is a very thick pericardium in the way? No, they will not reach the heart impulse as well. So you'll find diminished QRS voltage, decreased amplitude of the QRS. If you do echo or cardiac catheterization, you find equalization of pressure between all chambers. But this phenomenon will be more prominent in cases of severe pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade. Let's look at the neck veins. You see the square root sign. Where's the square root? Oh, look at this. Doesn't this look like the good old square root of mathematics? Why is this? Because there is prominent Y way of descent. Easy come, easy go. If you descend deeply, you ascend deeply. And this is the square root sign. And why the suddenness? Because I was trying to relax until I hit the wall. If you measure the atrial natriuretic peptide and brain natriuretic peptide, it's usually normal. And this is how you differentiate between constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy usually has high brain natriuretic peptide. Moreover, restrictive cardiomyopathy usually has palpable apical pulse. However, in constrictive pericarditis, the apical impulse is not palpable. How can I treat this patient with a very thick calcified pericardium? Well, remember, this is dystrophic calcification. It's irreversible. It's not going back. So you can remove the pericardium by surgical pericardiectomy remove that thick layer of calcification. And of course, you need to treat the cause and treat the complications. Speaking of complications, the patient can develop proteinuria, heart failure, hepatic congestion, ascites, cirrhosis, portal hypertension, and secondary intestinal lymphangiectasia. And sometimes accumulation of lymph, yeah, actual lymph in the peritoneum, because everything is blocked, everything is backing up. If you want to download these doozy notes, go to my website, medicosisperfectionalist.com.
Constrictive pericarditis mnemonic. It's a very thick calcified pericardium. It's hard as a rock. This is dystrophic calcification. Lub knock instead of lub dub. Pulses paradoxus, cosmol sign, equalization, equalization, and square root sign. You should do with pericardiectomy. Quiz time. In patients with cardiac tamponade, what's going to happen to their cardiac output? How about blood pressure? Heart rate? total perf resistance, central venous pressure, and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Let me know your answers in the comments. You will find the answer key in my video titled Cardiac Tamponade. If you want to learn about angina and myocardial infarction, as well as ventricular arrhythmias, ischemic strokes, hemorrhagic strokes, drowning, hypothermia, hyperthermia, acute respiratory distress syndrome, diabetic ketoacidosis, and much more, download my emergency medicine high yields course at medicosisperfectionalist.com. To learn about cardiac pharmacology as the antihyperlipidemics, antiarrhythmics, antihypertensives, diuretics, digoxin, download my cardiac pharmacology course. There are more than 300 premium videos on this channel. To get all of them, please click the join button and choose the highest tier. Smash like, subscribe, hit the bell, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, and Venmo. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you'd like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Schnellus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Medicine and sense, two words that do not go together, like airline service.